Good morning, everybody. Good morning, my church family. And good morning, everybody out there watching online. So glad that you're here and watching as well. First of all, we want to wish you all a happy and safe and healthy 4th of July. And please remember to pray for our country. For those of you who are here, don't forget to fill out your connection cards there in the seat pocket in front of you, unless you're in the first row. And share your prayer requests with us, as, as well as your pray, praises as well. Um, and our offering envelopes are also in the seat pockets there. And if you're watching online, you can please give us a shout out in the comment section and say hello. Hello. Uh, seniors, uh, there's a luncheon coming up at the end of this month, so mark your calendars for Friday, July 28th. We're going to uh, share in a special fellow t fellowship time at the old California Mining Company, and um, we have a few, few more weeks to go, but uh, we'll give out more details as it gets closer. Uh, the ladies' Bible study has officially gone on summer break. Uh, we're going to miss each other, though, but we plan on getting together uh, a couple times between now and September, but uh, we'll let you know, too. We'll keep you posted when that will be, too. And uh, our man-to-man -man group continues, <laughs> good for them, on Thursdays at 9 a.m. at Tom's 22. And if you're a guy and you like good conversation and sharing along with good breakfast... Plan on joining this men's group. I heard it's, it's good. Uh, because of the 4th of July, there's no youth group this week. Psalm 47.2 says, For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great king of all the earth. So now let's all stand, please, and worship this morning, our only king forever. church. Put your hands together. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only 
the King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Be set 
set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. Oh, you lay down your life. you done for me.
Well, good morning to everyone. You are here on a holiday weekend. <laughs> That's impressive. I like that. And I'm just so glad you showed up. I didn't want to preach to nobody, so you're here. Thank God. And, you know, um, a couple of days ago, we were at a memorial service. And, boy, it seems like that you go to quite a few. As you get older, you go to more of them, and pretty soon it could be your own. Chris and Lori Green, back in the house. Yay. I knew it would happen. <laughs> um, so we're at this memorial service, and it was for a very special friend of ours, and some of you were friends of uh, Carol Grinier as well. And I don't think I've been to a memorial service so honoring to God because of the life that she lived. It was amazing. And if you knew Carol, you knew she was a straight shooter. She was, she was German. She was out there. She made it clear where she stood. And throughout the whole service, it kept coming back to one thing, her faith. And we had, one, we had the privilege of visiting with her just uh, days before her passing. And by the time we left, we got encouraged by her. We went out there to encourage her. She encouraged us because of her clear vision of God himself. And so I'm so thankful to have been a part of that. So, and, um, so we were sitting around our uh, kitchen table, and Judy and Samantha and I were talking about the service and... Um, then all of a sudden we decided to, the topic shifted to like dying. Now there's an encouraging thing, dying on a Friday night, you know. What do we talk about? Let's talk about death. And we did. And um, I explained to Samantha, I've got a little file on my computer, and that file, Sam's Memorial Service. I've taken charge of it, I've written down things that should be shared and said, and songs that should be sung. So among the song list <laughs> is, um, are some beautiful hymns and choruses that have meant a lot to me through the years. And then there's some songs from the secular side that for some reason just spoke to me, all truth is God's truth. And 
So uh, we were talking, and Judy says, uh, we're not playing that song. And I said, you're not the one dying here. I am the one. I am the one. This is my service, me. It's, uh, and so she said, no. So, and sort of put Sam in the middle, and so we continued to talk, and I explained that whoever honors this document and sees that it is done and its completion will get a reward. <laughs> and Sam goes. So still negotiable. I did take out one of the songs, and, but I left in the ones that, where I want to land it. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. We are preparing in this world for the next world, and we are going to go there someday. And where we go and how we get there is going to be completely dependent upon one person and our faith and trust that we have put in, uh, been put in when we put our life in his hands. So, uh, death. You know, you can't plan your death. You can't say something like, okay, 10 o'clock this morning, I'm going to have breakfast. At 2 o'clock, I'm going to play golf. And at 4 o'clock, I'm going to die. <laughs> That's not going to happen. You don't plan your death. Now, it is planned. There is an appointment, and this will be, if anybody here often run late for appointments? Okay, yeah. So if you run late for an appointment, this is one appointment you will not run late for. <laughs> you will be there because God sets the appointment. Nobody, nobody will miss this appointment. It is appointed unto man once to die. The Bible says it, and then comes the judgment. But we're moving in that direction from the time that we're born. We're starting slowly um, to die. We're heading toward that. And as we head toward it, we ought to really kind of look at this backwards. We ought to decide how we're going to die and look backwards as to how we're going to live. And so I want to talk about that today from 2 Timothy and here is chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul speaking about his own death, which is close. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. That day's coming. We cannot change it. We can anticipate that it's going to be nearby. Uh, our bodies don't quite work the way they did when we were younger. That's why I love to have older and younger people in a church, because youth bring passion, they bring vision, they um, bring energy to us, and older saints bring wisdom and knowledge. They've been around the block enough times to where sometimes you don't even have to say a word. But it's like a car. You know, a car, you get it shiny and new and everything's working. Everything works until it doesn't. And when that car stops uh, working in this area or that, you take it, you get it repaired, you do maintenance on it, fix these little things because it's a part of you, you like it. But one day, the car gets traded in. And it's going to be traded in for something brand new. I cannot wait to get a brand new body. How about you? I'm ready. I mean, I get a brand new vehicle because the old one just lasted as long as it was supposed to. I can just picture it now like a beautiful electric vehicle. There will not be, there will not be a power shortage up there. There's not going to be. There'll be plenty of electric, don't worry. I won't be stranded in the universe. <laughs> Paul says, I am already being poured out like a drink offering. 
And, you know, if you think back to the Old Testament, you know what he's talking about. There were various offerings laid on the altar, and this fresh wine was poured onto the offering. And Paul says, I'm poured out. I'm about ready to be poured out as an offering. He looks at first the past. I'm already being poured out. You know, death is inevitable. 100%, last time I checked, 100% of people have died. You know, nobody's ever kind of escaped it. A couple of people in the Bible that went straight there. But outside of them, we all will face death. Now, that's not relevant, as relevant, I should say, to a person that's younger. But as you go through the decades and you get closer, it becomes extremely relevant. It ought to be relevant to each one of us all the time because we never know how long our life here lasts. Somebody goes 70, 80, 90 years. Somebody occasionally makes it over 100, and we say, they lived a long life, but not in light of eternity. No, a drop in the bucket. So whether we die young or we die old, it is an appointment that God makes. He knows when we're coming there to him. So I've been poured out as a drink offering. Live your life, somebody said, live your life with death in mind and work backwards. What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want the end of your life? What do you want people to say? It moved me when so many people were willing to share Carol's story and her story, I can give it to you. It's got a little scan code, and she wrote her life story. And it moves it moved those who have read it, and I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Live life this way, with death in mind, and look ba- and work backwards. Pour it out as a drink offering. Why? The time has come for my departure. You go to the airport, and you see that there are arrivals and departures. Last week, we celebrated an arrival, and that little baby that was dedicated brought fresh life to us. It was beautiful to see right here in this room someone bringing their child and giving him to the Lord. Arrivals. And there are departures. And Paul is ready to depart. The time for my departure has come. That means two things. The word departure, it means the unloosening of the uh, ropes that are holding a ship in the harbor. And those ropes are released. They're untied. The ship is set free to go on the journey, the next journey. This word also means like pulling up the tent pegs on a tent and moving to the next destination. You know, I'm not much of a camper. And Judy and I, our idea of camping is the Hampton Inn. (laughs) It is. But to those of you who love to camp, you have been gone camping through all the years. Picture Paul saying, the pegs are getting ready to be taken up and we're moving on. What a beautiful story that Paul tells. You know, I'm a ship that's getting ready to head out in the harbor. I'm a tent that's getting ready to be pulled up. You know, the Bible and Paul specifically talks about our lives as a tent. This earthly tent is perishable. It can get holes in it. Problems can happen with it. It's a tent. I wonder, I was thinking about this, why do we pay so much attention to our tent, <laughs> our outward body? I mean, we pamper it, we, we try to make it look better, we put our best foot forward. It's just a tent. It's not going to last forever. It's perishable. And yet, we're going to receive new tents, new bodies. So he says, my time of departure is at hand. I'm moving on. I know it's close. And the tent is going to be picked up and moved. 
to the most unbelievable campground. The ship is getting ready to go on such an incredible journey. It's interesting. A few days before his death, a guy named F.B. Meyer, a famous theologian and preacher, he said he knew he was getting ready to die, and he wrote this to a friend. I have just heard, to my great surprise, that I have but a few days' life to live. A few days to live. It may be that before it reaches you, I have entered into the palace. Do not trouble to write. We shall meet in the morning. Beautiful. We'll meet in the morning. I'm going to see Carol Grenier again. I'm going to see all the friends and loved ones that have gone on to be a part of um, this life and into the next. That is going to be a phenomenal reunion, not only with them, but from people way back and people back in biblical times. I mean, I just want to sit down and talk to some of them like for hours and hours and hours. Death is not something to be dreaded. Paul says, tent pegs are going up. We're moving on. The ship's pulling out of the harbor. We're going to loosen the cords and put it out there on such a shiny sea. That's death looking back to the past. Paul remembers these things. He also looks at the present. Look at verse 7. I learned this when I was a teenager. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. It's a good fight. It's a fight that is worth it. Would you agree, agree that we're always battling stuff in life? Stuff is going on and you feel like that you can't dodge the bullet sometimes? He says, I have fought the good fight, not just any fight. We're all fighting fights all the time and having battles, but Someday, someday, that fight will be looked back upon and you think that's a good fight. It's a spiritual battle. It's a war. And what does that make you or me? It makes us soldiers in the fight. Now, soldiers, they're not relaxing. They're not on vacation all the time. They're in the battle and they're prepared for it. They know that the day is coming when they'll be awarded for risking their life on the line. I fought the good fight, Paul says. I've finished the race. By the way, if you think Paul hadn't fought the fight, think again. I mean, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, he tells about the fight that he's been on. Can he write that? I've fought a good fight. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 11. I've worked much harder. I've been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count. I've been at death's door time after time. I've been flogged five times with the Jews, 39 lashes, beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times and immersed in an open sea night and day in hard traveling year. In and out, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city. I've been at risk in the country, endangered by sun and sea storm, betrayed by those I thought were brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, Many a time in lonely night without sleep, I've many missed a meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather, and that's not the half of it. When you, when you throw in the daily pressures and anxiety of all the churches, and when someone gets to the end of the rope, I feel desperation in my bones, and when somebody is duped by sin, an angry fire burns in my gut. Would you say Paul was having a little more than just a hard day? Paul says, I fought this stuff. I fought a good fight. It's a noble calling. I think if I was to summarize the whole message, including that part, I would say this. It 
is worth it. It's worth it. Whatever we're going through, whatever the battles are, we know the commander in chief. We know the day's coming. We know we're going to depart into a life far greater. It's a noble calling. It's a good fight. And if you can possibly give your life over to this more and more, if this is the life you have chosen, you have chosen a noble calling. There is nothing that you can do greater than giving your life to follow Jesus Christ. Nothing is greater than that. No goal, no dream, no aspiration. And I know some of you get that, that this is your calling, and it's unmistakable to herald the word and preach it. I finished the race. The image here is a foot race. Don't you enjoy movies like that where there's a race, people running a marathon, you see them struggling, you know what they're going through, but they've finished the course. Somehow they get to the finish line. You don't know if they're going to make it or not. But finally, somehow, in spite of immense trouble, they, they get right up and they cross the line and people are cheering. That's Paul. He finished that race. He did. We know that. And that's why he says it. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. What faith? You know, you hear somebody casually say, you know, I finished the race. I kept the faith. Keep the faith, people say. What does that mean? Everything Paul's been talking about for these chapters Every bit of the description of that faith, once and for all delivered to the saints, amazing faith, the faith, the sound doctrine that he talked about, and preaching the word, not because it's what everybody always wants to hear, but because it's his message, and we must preach it. He kept the faith. A lot of people don't, frankly. A lot of people start the faith with great fervor. Seed falls in the ground. It comes up quick. Oh, we've got a plant. And then the sun scorches it or riches strangle it. And uh, the cares of the world distract it. And not everybody keeps the faith. Not everybody that's here this year may be here next year. But I've kept the faith. I fought the battle. I finished the course, and I kept the faith. So he's ready to die. And Paul's frank about it. Time of my departure is at hand. I've been poured out like a drink offering. But, you know, a lot of people fear death um, and dying. I don't fear death. I sometimes think about how is it going to happen, what are the circumstances, and people ask me, is it going to be painful Maybe. Am I going to linger a long time and be a burden to people? Possibly. Is this going to go on and on and on? Who knows? But we have the opportunity right up to the end of this to run the race and keep the faith and fight the, fight the war, fight the battle. It's a good fight. It's the race, the course to run. Keep the faith. Now, a lot of people have faced death differently in different times. Voltaire, um, outspoken critic of Christianity, at the end of his life, what, how did he die? Here's what he said. I, have abandoned, I, I am abandoned by God and people. I will give half of what I am worth if you can give me six more months of life. Then I shall go to hell, and you will go with me Oh, Christ. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's horrible. I mean, but that was the end of the life of an atheist. If you think about it differently, D.L. Moody, a great preacher, quite a while back, revival came where Moody was, and he said this on his deathbed, I see earth receding and heaven is opening 
God is calling me. Kind of sounds like Stephen in the book of Acts. He looked up and he saw the heavens right before he was martyred. You know, how we approach death ought to be um, by looking backwards and starting our lives and building it on the rock-solid faith of Jesus Christ. It's all that matters. I don't care where you go to school. I don't care the degree you get. I don't care who you marry. I don't care about all those things. They fade in comparison, and they're important things, but they fade in comparison to the number one relationship, the number one goal, the number one vision in our life, to finish well, to complete our lives built around him. And then Paul looks at the future. Listen to what he says next. Verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also all who have longed for his appearing. Paul says, I'm going to get a crown someday. And it's not a kingly crown. It's the victor's crown in a race. It was a laurel wreath placed upon their head, indicating that they had finished the course, that they won. I mean, if this was today, you'd look at the Olympic Games. And if you look at the Olympic Games, people are going to stand up on that stage, and they're going to win the gold, the silver, the bronze. And we cheer because we know what it took for them to get there. You get a reward. It's why I'm not looking for any rewards. Well, this is not a reward based upon works. It's not salvation. Oh, here's salvation because you fought so hard or you ran so hard and that you did these things. It's a reward based upon a life well lived. We're all going to be judged. Do you realize this? We're all going to be judged and non-believers are going to be judged in relationship to salvation, whether they accepted what they knew to be true of Christ. This, this judgment seat, the bema, it's called, is a judgment of works. Your life as a believer will be evaluated and it will be uh, for the blazing light of Christ himself. You're going to be judged on your works, how you lived your life, how you finished, how you set goals spiritually and fulfilled them. And your reward will be a part of that. How you used your gifts, how you used your time, how you used your talents, it's all going to be revealed someday. And I just can imagine it that God's going to say, Sam, you, you did pretty good on that one. I saw your heart. I saw what you were trying to accomplish. But why did you focus so much on this? Why didn't you trust me more in this? And we're going to stand, everyone, every believer, before his judgment seat, and our lives are going to be evaluated. Never forget that. The reward will stand before him someday. And he says, on that day, he's going to get a reward. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What's the reward going to base, be based in? Oh, I put so many hours in the church. You know, I did this job. I was faithful. I was out in the community. I won people to Christ. He doesn't say that. He says, this reward is for those who love him, who long for his appearing, who are waiting on him to come. Why do we dread death so much? Why do we want to stay here? As good as some of the parts of it may be, think about there. Nothing to compare. Whatever good happens here, whatever is beautiful here, oh, it's a hundred billion times more in heaven. You'll be rewarded according to your gifts. I mean, imagine this. You're in heaven, and these, these crowns are being passed out. And you see a little lady, you remember her from somewhere, and you see this little woman, and she never stood out, and yet she's got this 
amazing crown on her head. You think, how'd she do that? Well, she was the lady that was over in the corner while you were doing so much fancy stuff and praying. <laughs> she was praying. She was probably the reason that any growth was happening, any good was happening, anything was happening because of her. And then there's others. And you think, man, if anybody's going to get a crown, it's, it's him or it's her. I mean, they're amazing. And their crown is not as bold. It's diminished. And you know why? It's not just based on what we do, but why we do it. It's the motive. See, God can look in the heart. We can see gifted, talented people, amazing speakers, and we can put them up on pedestals and then realize it was not for what it was meant. The motive was off. That's why it's discouraging if we see somebody fall from the faith, not finish the faith. But God can see in our hearts, and there is a reward for anyone in this room. does not matter what your gifts are. Did you use them? does not matter how talented you are. He's not interested in your ability. He's interested in your availability. There will be awarded to me on that day. That's affirmation. Paul was going to get a reward, shouldn't he? He did all that stuff. He went through all that stuff. He wrote half the New Testament. But he says, that's not just for me. And spiritual rewards aren't just for preachers or leaders of any sort. It's for every single one of you. And one day, you're going to stand before God, and he's going to award, award you according not just to the life that you lived or how hard you worked, but how much you love him. You love his appearing. You know, the church is losing its um, focus on that. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Did you ever think about it recently? Did you stop and really contemplate that he could come today? Are you ready? What would you do in the last six hours or 10 hours or five days or a month if you knew you had a month to live? A lot of the things you would do, you'd probably stop doing, stop focusing on. And things that you've been remiss in or haven't really made a priority will suddenly become priorities. Get things right in a relationship. Forgive that person. Love that unlovely person. Convince someone nearby you and your family to get ready and to place their faith in Christ as you have. I'm glad Carol Grinder finished well. She worked hard. She was diligent. She was honest. But she loved the Lord more than anything, and that's what counted. She finished well. Will I? I pray so. I want to. Will you? You're the source of my prayer that each and every one of you will grow in your faith and finish your life pleasing to God. Aim for this little phrase. Well done good and faithful servant. Well done. Way to go. That matters more than any goal that you have. And if you're daring, give your life to serving him full time, professionally. Serve him. Change course if you need to, but always make your goal running the race and fighting the fight and finishing this course. Father in heaven, I thank you this morning for oh, this group of people, the church. I thank you for the faithfulness, some of the little ladies, some of the faithful men who are out to finish and hear the words, well done. And Father, I ask that 
we would be counted among them. And Father, we want that crown so that we can just take that crown and lay it down at your feet and say, Jesus, you paid it all. All to you I owe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If any of you need a cup, ushers are coming forward. Communion is a time to remember. Remember what the Lord did for us, took our sins, paid the penalty, paid the bet, paid the bill with his death on the cross. Remember that he rose again from the dead and brought us the gift of salvation. Remember the words from the scripture that says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you show forth my death, and you remember me until I come again. And another verse he says, just do in remembrance of me. Well, I grew up in a church and we sang songs all the words were written in the hymn book. There was nothing printed up there. The only instrument we had was a piano. No drums, no bass, no guitars. Oh, how different we are today. And the only time we ever repeated the words were when we, when we did the chorus. Well, this morning I'd like to bring your remembrance. Think about what's in your head. We have a lifetime of memories up here. Wow, what a gift that God gave to us for that. So let me take you back in time. You remember when you were in Sunday school, the first thing you ever learned? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, because the Bible tells me so. And it wasn't long afterwards we sang, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red or yellow, black or white, they're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Well, I grew up and I got to go to big church. And, and we sang songs like, um, well, let's see. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He had no tears for his own griefs, but he had drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful. And my song will ever be of my Savior's love for me. And then years I spent in vanity and pride, knowing not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me, and there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Well, there's four Sundays every month, but sometimes we got five Sundays. Three times this year we got five Sundays. In our church, if we had a five Sunday Sunday, we had sing spiration. That means the congregation got to pick the songs that we were gonna sing at our Sunday evening service. Three aisles, two people from each one, the music selector, selector would choose, would raise their hand, and he would say, okay, what page would you like? And someone would say, whatever the song was, and we would turn in our hymn books to that, and, and we'd all sing that, piano would play, we would sing that. You know what was really surprising? When a young person was picked, they didn't pick those new songs. They picked Amazing Grace, How Great, How Sweet Thou Are, or It Is Well With My Soul, or even the Old Rugged Cross. But I had a different thing. 
when I got selected, the music director would just say, okay, everyone, page 218, Jim's favorite, and we would sing, wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? And where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, of the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. Isn't that wonderful? Still my favorite. Well, in two days we're going to be celebrating our national, our nation's Independence Day. And we have been so blessed as a country because God has given us victory in so many battles. So I thought two songs that had the word victory in it belong in this talk. My dad was in World War II. He was somewhere out there in the Pacific Islands fighting the war. And our church in Camden, New Jersey, almost every person here, every person there, had relatives or loved ones that were part of the military. And so we would sing this song, which I've only heard on the East Coast, so you've never heard this one before. V is for victory. Sing it out. It's a glorious word. V is for victory. It is ours through Christ our Lord. Some days may be dark and drear, but with Christ, the word's all clear, for we have victory, victory in Christ the Lord. Well, my dad came home, and after a lousy winter in New Jersey and a hot summer, we moved to San Diego, and we joined a big church, and they had a different hymn book that we had in New Jersey, and I found this one other song. I heard an old, old story, how a savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groanings, I have heard about his sufferings, and I repented of my sins and I won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I hope that I hope that I've opened up your memory this morning. Remember why we're having communion. This do in remembrance to me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of memory that you gave us. Thank you for inspiring through your Holy Spirit the people who wrote these words and the music that went with them. Lord, as we think about what you've done for us in the past, thank you for that. And now we think about what you're doing, the blessings we have today. And then we think by faith how glorious it's going to be. Like our pastor said, what heaven's going to be like. Thank you, Lord. Help us to remember as we partake of communion. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remember.
Jesus our Savior. And I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. We believe in the name of Jesus, amen. We trust in him and we put our faith in him. Good morning, church. It's at this time that we are going to be taking our offering in worship and service to our God. Uh, it is at this time that I would like to say goodbye and, uh, and good morning to our, uh, our, our online service, our live stream. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have an amazing week and God bless.